Okay, so thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. I um, should say from the get-go, I'm an economist by training, so um, uh, I work a lot with computer scientists, but uh, my training is very much in the area of working with um, social science data, very large-scale data, and so my interaction with Brian and uh, Jupiter has come out in the context of me working with data in order to solve problems. And so it's in that context I'm going to talk to you uh, about how we use Jupiter today. My background, as I said, as an economist, I'm in the Wagner School of Public Policy at, at New York University. I'm in the provost's office as well. And um, I have an appointment at the Center for Urban Science and Progress. So looking at um, uh, confidential microdata for um, understanding uh, human behavior is basically um, my background. Okay. Um, and so, you know, I, I kind of like this line a lot. Uh, uh, I am, my, my original training was as a statistician and econometrician. Um, and then I finally figured out that having masses amounts of data, massive amounts of data, beat um, torturing the, the equations to get to the third standard, uh, uh, third point um, to the right of the uh, decimal in terms of figuring out standard errors. Um, and, and so I, I, oh, I really like, I, I was told I had to have this on for the recording, is that right? Um, uh, but, you know, here's the thing that you realize um, when you've been working with a lot of sensitive data um, across organizations. So, um, you know, th this is certainly true when you're dealing with data in the public sector. Uh, and it's also true when you're dealing with data in the private sector, but I'm going to talk about it primarily in the context of the public sector, which is, you know, um, in any organization, if you only knew what everyone knew, would be much more profitable. And, and, and let me give you um, two concrete examples for this. One was how I kind of got into this field 20 years ago, and then one more current. And then I'll show you how kind of we worked in to uh, start working with Brian um, for, for, for my sins. So uh, about 25 years ago, I was interested in understanding, and, the, and don't go to sleep on me when I say this, the dynamic interrelationship of workers and firms. So, so why, do, why do we care about this? Well, I'm, an econ I'm a labor economist interested in the determinants of earnings and employment outcomes of workers. And I'm also interested in the productivity and growth of firms. So it turns out that you can't answer those questions with only looking at a data set of workers, um, because in order to understand the impact of firms on workers, you need um, a, re a data set that's representative of workers. And in order to understand the impact of firm or, or workers on firms, you need a representative data set of firms. And you can't have both at the same time because most workers work for big firms and most firms are small because of the skewness of the way in which human activity typically takes place. So what that meant was that I needed universe data on all workers and all firms in the United States. Right. <laughs> so that's what I did. Uh, Turns out there are two data sets that enable you to capture universe data on, on firms and workers. You clearly can't do it in a survey. You have to use it using administrative records. There are two sources of those data. There's unemployment insurance wage records, which are uh, f uh, um, records that are filed every quarter by every firm in every state in the US, in the covered sector, in for, the, for every worker they have in that quarter, and it's got their name, their SSN, and their earnings. So it's confidential microdata, right? You don't want that stuff floating around. Don't want to put it out in open data format. Um, and then the other one is our friends at the IRS. There's tax data. You know, if you misuse tax data, 
Uh, does anyone know what the penalty is for Title 26 under the US Code? 10 years in jail and or uh, three quarters of a million dollar fine. So you don't kind of want that data floating around, right? So um, I not, saw enormous amounts of churning. The value proposition for public policy was huge because what you could see, you could see enormous amounts of churn in the United States, uh, way beyond what survey data is able to tell you. So, um, you know, first Friday of every month, they come out and say, X number of new jobs have been added in the economy, right? And they'll say something like 160,000 new jobs. Stop for a minute. Is that possible? In an economy with, I don't know, 140 million jobs, how is it possible that the, there's only 160,000 new jobs or 200,000 new jobs? Well, they're looking at the net. So what you really want to do is you want to look at that dynamic interrelationship. You want to know something about who those workers are. Right. So what you have to do is you have to match those administrative records, which only have EIN, employer ID number, social security number, name, and earnings. You want to, in order to really understand what's going on, you want to match it with something about the characteristics of the workers and the characteristics of the firms. So you need data from the Social Security Administration on, that are going to link by Social Security number. And you're going to want data on um, the characteristics of the businesses, which are at the Census Bureau, and something about the households, which are at the Census Bureau. So right. So we did that. It was a non-trivial activity. Uh, and we built the LEHD program at the US Census Bureau. And it turns out that's the, it created a whole new frame for understanding the US economy. Because instead of looking at just work, or in addition to, I should say, looking at just at workers and at firms, what we had was a whole new frame which was called jobs. Okay, and you could track them either by firms, because you've got the EIN linked over time, and the SSN linked over time. But there were massive confidentiality issues because I didn't want to go to jail, right? And I don't have three quarters of a million dollars I can just write over to the federal government. So there's lots of confidentiality issues that you have to address for legal reasons, for ethical reasons, for professional reasons, for all of that kind of, uh, for all of that co those kind of reasons. So, you know, that's, and these are massive files. So even back, I was doing this in the late 90s. It took a good seven years to get this program up and running. It's still running. It's the first, and to my knowledge, still the only national statistical program that was started by a researcher. Um, it's got $12 million in appropriated congressional funds, and it's a major activity now at the Census Bureau. Massive amount of data. It was, uh, for the state of California, for example, it would, they'd be shipping us a terabyte of data every quarter, and even though the Census Bureau is used to big data sets, and kind of uh, gum up the old works, right? So, so um, that was a, a, an example where for pennies, because it only costs a, a, under a penny to process one of those records, where it costs about between $1,000 and $1,500 to collect a piece of survey data by the time all the processing and field interviewing and, and cleaning is done. Um, so help the taxpayer out, cost pennies, gave us incredible new insights into the economy. The Sloan Foundation was, was one of the original supporters of it. And it is now one of the most used data sets uh, that uh, certainly labor economists use, and I believe uh, uh, certainly the, the NSF and the Sloan Foundation um, uh, use. So that kind of motivates why you want to use these confidential microdata. And, and that was 20 years ago. So let me tell you a shorter story but why we care about it even now. Um, so David L. Wood, who some of you may know, he's at the Kennedy School, um, has this great story. He was working with the Gates Foundation to help improve mobility um, from poverty. And he's got this great story about um, the commissioner um, for health in um, Baltimore. And as she said, she said, every time a kid dies in Baltimore, she says, you know, all the commissioners who touch that family, like um, uh, homeless, education, um, uh, welfare, you know, all the different programs that they might have touched, the government programs, we're talking about public policy here, they all get together and they have a file on the kid that's this thick. But she said, the only time we can ever share that data is when the kid is dead. Right? 
So how can we bring together data that means something? And I don't mean to slam computer scientists. Some of them are close to being human beings. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I don't give a damn about 311 taxi rides, and I don't give a damn about how the bikes are ridden around the country. I want to figure out how to improve public policy on human beings, which means that we need to figure out how to work with sensitive microdata. Okay? So that creates all kinds of problems. Um, as you would expect, um, particularly when we're dealing with government data, uh, there's limited internal capacity to work with the data. If you um, think about it, there aren't the resources within federal, state, and particularly local governments um, of the workforce. It's management by Excel, right? Trying to link data um, across agency lines is very often done by putting together, for example, two business registers in Excel and a human being matching the rows and another human being validating it, right? So that's the, yes, I know, it's true. It is true, yeah. Um, obviously, they're gonna worry about security. There's a lot of legal mandates around access and use that you have to worry about. And um, there's lots of data sharing issues. You know, people worry about the cost, they worry about the burden. Quite frankly, they worry about the data quality Right? It's, it's done for the administration of government programs, not necessarily for the uh, analysis. Uh, again, because it's for administrative purposes, not necessarily for analytical purposes, the data documentation are bad. And they're really worried that the analysis that is done is crap. And that, and that can really create lots of problems. So let me give you an example. I'm not going to mention the people who are doing this work, but... Um, using administrative data on schools. So you've got cohorts of kids coming into a school. And um, what they want to do is they want to create indicators of whether the school's any good or not, right? So you take a cohort of kids coming in in ninth grade, and then you look at the proportion who graduate by 12th grade, and that is one of the measures. And you just look at the administrative records. So what's the problem with that? Move. Students move, right? And what kind of students move? All kinds. All kinds, particularly those damn foreigners, right? We've got a real problem with the foreigners. <laughs> that's, at least that's what my mother-in-law says. Um, <laughs> at, at, she, my line is, uh, she always wanted my husband to marry a nice St. Louis girl, and she got one out of those three. <laughs> so... Uh, <laughs> Anyway, so this is where working with Jupiter comes in, right? So um, what you really want to do is you kind of want to build an environment in which, because uh, the problem is going to be when you've got sensitive data, you're going to have to twist yourself into a pretzel to get access to the data, to work with the data. It's going to be very difficult to get the replicability and, uh, and to have other people the people within the agency understanding what was done so that examples of the bad analysis um, can be corrected and worked with before someone publishes an article that shows up on the front page of the New York Times which says school X is lousy because 10% of their students graduate, right? So they've got a chance to, to, to be part of that conversation. And so... Um, we were actually one of the first users, I believe, of IPython Notebook uh, back in the day when we first started building these, the, what I'm going to talk to you about um, and I'm, what I'm going to uh, spell out a little bit more. So um, the, the context that I'm going to talk to you about today is, is, is um, a little bit looking um, backwards. Uh, in 2016, um, Patty Murray and Paul Ryan uh, uh, passed an act, they actually did something in Congress in, in March, which is called the Evidence-Based Policy Commission. 
And what they did was they recognized all those problems with pulling administrative records together, and they said, well, what are we going to do about it? And so they, what a shock, they formed a commission of 15 people to go and figure out what they should do in order to, um, in order to address these public policy issues. They gave the Census Bureau, with which I've been affiliated for a long time, a chunk of change to build an administrative records clearinghouse. And so the basic idea there was, let's provide a secure environment so agencies can put their data in there, their administrative records, so that I could put education data and workforce data and uh, uh, welfare data together. And then we could evaluate the public programs so that we could deliver data more efficiently, right? Let me pause there and think, how many agencies do you think would put their data into a clearinghouse so that people could evaluate them <laughs> at the federal <laughs> level? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> and in fact, that was, they, so Census turned to me and said, can you build a facility, a data facility, um, for, for the purposes of informing the deliberations of the commission. And I said, well, you know, I actually chaired the, the, the UK had tried to do something like this about three or four years earlier called the Administrative Data Research Network. Uh, and they had four centers in England, um, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. And guess what? They spent 38 million pounds, $50 million, and it took them that long to figure out what it took you about a nanosecond to figure out, which is that agencies weren't going to put their data in, right? So our question is, sorry, sorry about that. Um, so, so what they did was, uh, what we did was we said, it's not going to work if we just try and, it's, you could solve the technical solution spend $50 million doing it, and that's not what they gave us, but you know, much less than that. Consult the technical solution, but you've got to figure out the human solution. So what we said is, having worked with uh, IPython Notebook and, and built classes around using data to solve agency problems, said what we could do is build classes that um, were for the agencies, for agency staff, and they could work with their own data and the basic idea there is that if they're working with it, you're building up the capacity, you're addressing the legal mandates because it's people within the agency working with it, and you, if you set it up right, and this again is where Jupyter Notebook's going to come in, you can entice them to give you better documentation, and you're going to not run that risk of bad analysis. So in other words, you could develop prototype things and build up the staff capacity, link the data, and um, at least get that uh, kind of an ecosystem in place. So that's what we did. Um, and we built this thing called an administrative data research facility. We built classes around it uh, using Jupyter Notebook. I'm going to talk through a little bit about what we learned and where we're heading uh, in that process. So, um, and what I'm going to talk about is this project that I'm working on with Brian and Fernando, um, which is being generously funded by Sloan, Schmidt, and Overdeck Family Foundation, as well as Deutsche Bundesbank, but they don't want me to put their logo up there. Um, and so basically what we are doing, we're doing, going to do two things. Uh, we're going to build, or we have built, a secure platform, and that secure platform's got to worry about five things. So if you want to make the data safe, you know, I mean, you don't want your tax records out in the public any more than our fearless leader does, but for probably different reasons. Um, the, and he's your fearless leader, not mine. Um, that was a bit of a low blow, wasn't it? <laughs> um, but what you want to do is you want to have safe people, so we call it the five safes. Um, this is kind of standard across statistical agencies in the, in the, in the internationally. So you want to have safe people, that is people who are trusted coming in. You want safe settings. You only access it in a secure environment. Safe projects. So these are going to be approved projects. And safe outputs, that is that they're disclosure reviewed because microdata can be very easily re-identified. So you want to aggregate it up to a level when it's safe. 
and that's what gives you safe data. And then we're going to build a training program around that. So the project that we're working on with Brian and with Jupyter Notebook is how can we automate some of that? And how can we kind of um, uh, build Jupyter Notebooks to capture some of those elements in an automated rather than a manual manner? Okay. So, so let me tell you a little bit about the classes, which are kind of the... Yeah. If I understand correctly, so you are suggesting that uh, the departments will do their analysis and then they share the results. You will collect all the, all the departments and then do the collective research? So, the, the, so let me get very specific. So here's the basic idea. Um, what you want to give... Uh, what you want to do is you want to build... You don't want to build, it's a bad idea to say, I'm going to build a clearinghouse on all people and all of their activities, right? What you want to do is you, can, you should only build projects that have documented purpose that is consistent with the agency mission, and the only work that is done in them has to be consistent with what the... Um, <coughs> with what the agency is legally authorized to do. Does that make sense? So how do you build sets of questions and classes that um, address a multiple agency needs? So, so we, what, where we started was, we said, there, let's start with an obvious um, set of questions. So the obvious, the, or the ones with agencies that were very interested in being involved in this process. So the agencies that were interested were justice, housing, labor, um, and welfare, and corrections, I'm sorry. So here were the question, here was the overarching question that the agencies agreed to. It was, what is the impact of neighborhood characteristics and access to jobs on the earnings and employment outcomes of welfare recipients and ex-offenders and their subsequent recidivism and or retention on welfare. So in order to answer that question, you need to pull together data from multiple agencies. Does that make sense? So what you do is we built a set of applied data analytics classes that trained up people in those agencies, put them together in teams. So we had people who were um, data people, computer people, uh, policy people, and we put them together in teams because you need multiple sets of skills. It's not just a coding problem, it's an analytical problem and a policy problem and, a, and an understanding what the issues are problem. And, and, and let them loose, so they're from the agencies and they had to uh, figure out how to formulate questions, how to do database management that went beyond Excel, uh, how to link data that went beyond Excel, how to um, do machine learning, do prediction, how to do text analysis, network analysis, visualization, inference, and privacy and confidentiality. And that formed the arc of the class, so it's a 10-day class, set of classes, and, and we put, broke it up into modules. And that's what I call data science, right? Because it's not coding, it's a combination of people who know how to code, who understand the problems, who understand the data, who understand the policy, all talking together, which is what makes it team science. So, um, and, uh, and now what we're doing is adding in information about education. Um, so, what, we're, what that generates, the value proposition for the agency, is the staff get trained up. The value is new products get developed that help them serve their mission, that requires uh, data across agency lines. They have new networks across agencies, and they've got new measures of activity. Okay? And a uh, pathetic uh, ad for... Uh, the textbook that we generated as a result, as a result of this um, and, you know, consistent with the vision here, it's two computer scientists, uh, Ian Foster and Raid Ghani, 
uh, two economists, Ron Jarman and me. Ron is now the director of the Census, acting director of the Census Bureau, and Frau Kokroyta, who's a statistician. So it sounds like a little bit like a rabbi and a priest or walked into a bar, but you know, <laughs> there we are. Um, and that was, and, and that was the, the structure. So what we had to do, we, uh, and we had to build this technical environment that had all the characteristics that I was talking about. So we had to um, figure out who were our users, and then what are they going to want to do. And I'm going to talk a, a lot um, in the time that I have remaining about the access, discovery, and co collaboration, because that's very much core of how the Jupyter Notebooks are being used. So here's the structure of the environment, and here's the structure of how the training feeds in to all those moving parts. So basically, the idea here is you want the data user not just coming in and doing what we call data rape, right? Uh, it is building an environment in which their use is consistent with the needs and the uh, statutory mission of the agency, which who are the data producers and quite often the data stewards, and try to engage them with providing documentation. So I know that sounds boring. Everyone thinks, oh, metadata documentation is so boring. But it's critical to understanding what's going on. You know, you've got to understand variable B56 underscore 7 changed from six categories to four categories in 2002. What happened? What's, what's the difference? And the coverage of issues. Now, I've been involved in data for 25 years. I have never found anyone who does a decent job of data documentation. I mean, it's, everyone hates it. It's really lousy. And even when people do a good job, I can't find it because, like, if I'm looking for um, how many people are foreign born in the United States, let's say, they might have coded it non-resident aliens or uh, foreigners or uh, uh, non-native born or whatever. There'll be like 10 different things and I won't have thought of what they are. So this is a real challenge. And so one of the things that we wanted to do, and this is part of this project, is how can we, rather than just creating ontologies and trying to force human beings to use ontologies, how can we generate documentation out of the use? And how can we make Jupyter Notebooks part of that conversation, make it part of that workflow? And so where we headed on this, and I'll get a little bit more detail in just a minute, was to be inspired by Amazon and TripAdvisor. Right? So how many of you have used TripAdvisor when you try and figure out which hotel to go to? Right? Or Yelp or the restaurant. So you know, 20 years ago, you had no clue whether what anything about what was on the inside of a hotel. You knew it was a hotel. Now, what were, or you knew it was a restaurant and you knew the name. So you knew the user, sorry, the producer provided metadata documentation. You had the name of um, the restaurant and the type of the restaurant or whatever, or with Amazon, with a book you have, the, before Amazon, you, for a book you had the ISBN number, the name of the publisher and the title and the author. Now what's happened is that people willingly provide metadata documentation about the content of a book, about the content of a hotel, and you know, the way they've done it is they've built ways of rewarding people and, uh, and, um, and, and giving them kudos for it. So part of what we're trying to do is to build into the Jupyter, into your workflow, ways of people contributing knowledge about variable V56 underscore 7 that's part of their natural process. It's not imposed on them from outside. Okay. Um, and then also of providing feedback back to the data steward about what the data user's been doing through text analysis and other types of approaches. So, so that's where we're heading. So uh, what we're building then is the security, the discovery, data stewardship, collaboration, and training. So both the technical and the human engagement pieces. So it turns out, and I'm not going to bore you too much about this, there's this bear of a program that 
is um, the uh, called FedRAMP that enables you to define you know, how to protect the environment. So that's a technical solution. It takes you all oh, several million dollars and lots of blood, sweat and tears to build. The key thing here is it's a secure environment within which you cannot reach out to the internet. So it's remote, it's in an AWS cloud, but once you're in, you can't cut and paste. So it's much safer uh, and you can protect you know, the kind of tools that are available and so on. Uh, so that's what we built. We have sensors authorization to operate, but it's a standardized approach that we, we use. Now here comes the answer to your approach. So, so, so what effectively happens and the structure within which we're working is what the FedRAMP does is it enables us to build this administrative uh, data research facility with city walls. So there's um, uh, continuous monitoring, there's like the night watchman that checks all the time, there's pen testing that goes on and, and makes sure that the walls are safe. And then different agencies can build houses inside the city walls. So they own that. And they make sure that, the, and what we do is we provide them an environment in which they can share data across agency lines uh, or across state lines, which has not been able to be done before, uh, for approved people and approved projects in approved settings with approved um, disclosure review, and that's what gives them the safe data. So that original problem that I posed to you, where the commissioners in the city of Baltimore couldn't share their data, well, now they can. And so the first state that we've been working with, which goes back for historical reasons with Illinois, um, Department of Human Services secretary was saying the other day to the director of corrections, he said, you know, governor's office called me the other day in the morning and said, how many um, childcare providers have criminal correct convictions? He said, before, I wouldn't have been able to answer that question because that would have involved data across agency lines. So I wouldn't have known if there was an ax murderer <laughs> who was taking care of the state's at-risk children. He said, what I was able to do because of the ADRF and because he had trained staff who'd been trained through our program, I could just call down and they uh, could use the Jupyter notebooks that had been built to link these data across uh, agency lines and they were able to run it and in the afternoon I had an answer and the answer was six. Not, that, not ax murderers, but convicted criminals. <laughs> I, I don't think they had data on this. One thing we noticed, though, and going back to the metadata documentation, one thing that we noticed very much was that um, when they, people land on a data set, there's almost no information about what those data have been used for and no information about what the results have been, what the code is, and so on. It's, it, it's you know, they'll, they'll ask me, because I've been working with UI wage records for a long time, who else has worked on that? And I'll go, oh, well, so and so and so and so and so. That's a hell of a way to run a science, right? So how can we get the knowledge about um, who's worked on it and what? So how do we build this data discovery? So we went and talked to people who know something about encouraging people to engage. So we went and talked to the NYU game uh, lab, so they do a lot of these, um, uh, figure out how Wikipedia works, how war, World of War works, and all of these kinds of things, War of Worlds, whatever it is. I, the kids are playing it all the time. Um, and so they said, you know, here's the problem. You've got a large database that researchers and, and lawmakers have to access, but it's difficult to pass, and users are not encouraged to interact with or contribute to data, right? So what they want to do is they want to establish rich context. So they went out and looked at things that have worked. And you know what? Computer scientists do share code, do share information, and they get little badges, contributions, followers, shows how much they're uses. And I've sat on a bunch of NSF uh, computer science panels. And a lot of you guys 
and she put it on your CVs, right? So we could create an infrastructure that, that says, you know, you guys are good guys. And that's just like the um, TripAdvisor as well. And then that's going to enable people to do search and discovery. Collaboration, that's really been facilitated through the Jupyter Notebooks and other tools. And let me show exactly how that works. So here we have someone in the class working on corrections data. And she says, hey guys, um, so uh, I think she was with uh, Employment Security. And she says, hey, corrections data gurus, how can this result hold? And the CIO of the corrections who's working also in the class says, it's really bad data. Uh, you know, they could have spent forever working with that data and tried to beat on it, but because they're working together in a trusted environment, they're sharing that knowledge. And then someone else comes in and says, here's some code that's helpful and shares that. And here's someone else that comes in and says, here's some other useful code. And then here's someone else who comes in and says, by the way, we're looking at welfare recipiency. Here's some useful articles that can form part of that rich context. So that's precisely where we're heading. So the notion here with this uh, project, this funded project, is capture data from text and from class interactions so that as you're going on Jupyter Notebook, as you land on a data set, to your right comes up, you know, just like Amazon, here are other people like you who've been working with this data. Here are some of the results. Here's some of the code. And on the left-hand side, by the way, would you like to contribute just a couple of lines of code, right? Or, or tell us a little bit about this data set. So by being made part of the workflow, induce that metadata documentation out. Does that make sense? Um, and so in conjunction with uh, ICPSR and uh, Nature and other places, we're actually running a competition. We'd love you to help with that. So come up and uh, ask me afterwards. And uh, we'd love to get th those of you who are text gurus um, to help us think through how to uh, launch this, which will be launched September 4th. Um, and basically the idea is, is within this secure environment, uh, to build that um, rich context as they're working through the different data sets. So that's, I was told to shut up and I'm a very obedient uh, uh, person, but don't tell my husband. <laughs> So people can make the, uh, the room change if you need to. Um, you can go now, but if you have questions, you can certainly ask them. But you feel free to walk out if you're going somewhere else for the next session. If you'd like to take questions, of course. Yeah. Uh, yes. What's the URL for that uh, competition? Um, if you give me your card, we're not launching it till September 4th. So we're busily uploading the necessarily files. It'll be uh, collegeinitiative.org um, slash rich context competition, I think. But give me your card. Uh, because we're not actually launching it till the day after Labor Day. But your help would be greatly appreciated. I sent everyone to sleep. <laughs> OK. Well, anyway, I hope I've convinced you that this, uh, to keep an eye out for what we're up to next. And um, go forth and enjoy your other um, meetings. Thank you. Thank you.